Major floods along the Yangtze River resurrected the idea and the Chinese government, now the People's Republic, adopted it in 1954 for flood control. Vice Minister of Electric Power Li Rui initially argued that the dam should be multipurpose, that smaller dams should be built first until China could afford such a costly project, and that construction should proceed in stages to allow time to solve technical problems, according to Chinese scholars Kenneth Lieberthal and Michelle Oxenberg. Later, Li Rui concluded that the dam should not be built at all since it would be too costly, flood many cities and fertile farmland, subject the middle and lower reaches of the river to catastrophic flooding during construction, and would not contribute much to shipping. Sichuan province officials also objected to the construction since Sichuan, located upstream, would shoulder most of the costs while downstream Hubei province would receive most of the benefits. Lin Yushan, head of the Yangtze Valley Planning Office, who was in charge of the project, favored the dam construction, however. His optimism about resolving technical problems was further encouraged in 1958 by the favorable political climate and the support from the late chairman Mao Zedong, who wanted China to have the largest hydroelectric dam in the world, according to Lieberthal and Oxenberg. Criticisms were suppressed. But depression resulted from the disastrous Great Leap Forward and ended the preparation work in 1960. The idea resurfaced in 1963 as part of the new policies to build a third front of industry in southwest China. But the Cultural Revolution erupted in 1966, and in 1969 the fear that the dam would be sabotaged by the Soviet Union, now an enemy, resulted in a construction delay. In 1970, work was resumed on Gazhuba, a smaller dam downstream but it soon ran into severe technical problems and cost overruns that seemed likely to plague the Three Gorges Dam on an even larger scale. The economic reforms introduced in 1978 underlined the need for more electric power to supply a growing industrial base, so the State Council approved the construction in 1979. A feasibility study was conducted in 1982-1983 to appease the increasing number of critics who complained that the project did not adequately address technical, social, or environmental issues. Further feasibility studies were then conducted from 1985 to 1988 by Canadian International Project Managers Yangtze Joint Venture, a consortium of five Canadian engineering firms. According to Lieberthal and Oxenberg, leaders from Chongqing also demanded suddenly that the dam height be raised so substantially that it would cripple the project and free them from bearing the brunt of the costs. The new height and the demand for a more reliable study with the use of international standards resulted in a new feasibility study in 1986. In the face of much domestic and international pressure, the State Council agreed in March 1989 to suspend the construction plans for five years. After the Tiananmen Square protests of 1989, however, the government forbade public debate of the dam, accused foreign critics of ignorance or intent to undermine the regime, and imprisoned Dai Qing and other famous critics. Premier Li Peng crusaded for the dam and pushed it through the National People's Congress in April 1992 despite the opposition or abstention from one-third of the delegates. Such actions were unprecedented from a body that usually rubber-stamped all government proposals. Resettlement soon began, and physical preparations started in 1994. While the government solicited technology, services, hardware, and financing from abroad, leaders reserved the engineering and construction contracts for Chinese firms. Corruption scandals have plagued the project. It was believed that contractors had won bids through bribery and then skimped on equipment and materials to siphon off construction funds. The head of the Three Gorges Economic Development Corp allegedly sold jobs in his company, took out project-related loans and disappeared with the money in May 2000. Officials from the Three Gorges Resettlement Bureau were caught embezzling funds from resettlement programs in January 2000. Much of the project's infrastructure was so shoddy that Premier Zhu Rongji ordered it ripped out in 1999 after a number of high-profile accidents including the collapse of a bridge. Zhu Rongji, who had been a harsh critic of the project, announced that the officials had a mountain of responsibility on their heads. Around this time, a significant crack had also developed in the dam. To offset construction costs, 
project officials had quietly changed the operating plan approved by the NPC to fill the reservoir after six years rather than ten. In response, 53 engineers and academics petitioned President Zhang Zemin twice in the first half of 2000 to delay full filling of the reservoir and relocating the local population until scientists could determine whether a higher reservoir was viable given the sedimentation problems. Construction continued regardless. The name Sinkrude Tailings Dam often refers to the Mildred Lake Settling Basin, MLSB. This is an embankment dam that is, by volume of construction material, the largest earth structure in the world in 2001 when it is located 40 kilometers, 25 miles, north of Fort McMurray, Alberta, Canada at the northern end of the Mildred Lake lease owned by Sinkrude Canada Limited. The dam and the tailings artificial lake within it are constructed and maintained as part of ongoing operations by Sinkrude in extracting oil from the Athabasca oil sands. Other tailings dams constructed and operated in the same area by Sinkrude include the Southwest Sand Storage, SWSS, 2 which is the third largest dam in the world by volume of construction material after the Tarbala Dam. According to Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, COSIA, an alliance of oil sands producers formed in 2012, who share research on environmental priority areas, EPAs, such as tailing pond water and greenhouse gases, tailings are the sand, silt, clay and water found naturally in oil sands that remain following the mining and bitumen extraction process. 3. The hot water process used by Sunker and Sinkroot in their open pit mining operations, to extract bitumen from the Athabasca oil sands, OWS, produces large quantities of tailings pond sludge which remains stable for decades. By 1990 it was considered to be the imminent environmental constraint to future use of the hot water process. Four oil sands tailings pond water contains toxic chemicals such as naphthenic acids, NAS, and process chemicals. General Information Argentina, the eighth largest country in the world and the second largest in South America, has a land area approximately equal to that of the United States east of the Mississippi River. Its climate varies from subtropical in the north to subarctic in the south. Argentina shares borders with Bolivia, Brazil and Paraguay in the north, Uruguay to the east, and Chile to the west. The southeast border is a 3,000-mile coastline on the South Atlantic Ocean. The population of almost 37 million is primarily European, mostly of Spanish and Italian descent, Spanish is the national language. There are 23 administrative regions, called provincias, in Argentina, plus the city of Buenos Aires which is its own autonomous administrative region, these administrative regions are shown in figure 1. The capital city, Buenos Aires, is located on the Atlantic coast in the east-central part of the country and has a population of about 11.7 million. Argentina, the eighth largest country in the world and the second largest in South America has a land area approximately equal to that of the United States east of the Mississippi River. Its climate varies from subtropical in the north to subarctic in the south. Argentina shares borders with Bolivia, Brazil and Paraguay in the north, Uruguay to the east, and Chile to the west. The southeast border is a 3,000-mile coastline on the South Atlantic Ocean. The population of almost 37 million is primarily European, mostly of Spanish and Italian descent, Spanish is the national language. There are 23 administrative regions, called provincias, in Argentina, plus the city of Buenos Aires which is its own autonomous administrative region, these administrative regions are shown in figure 1. The capital city, Buenos Aires, is located on the Atlantic coast in the east-central part of the country and has a population of about 11.7 million. Argentina's currency, the peso, has an exchange rate of 2.81 pesos per US dollar, as of May 2003. The gross domestic product, GDP, was estimated at $282 billion in 1999. Argentina is a member of Mercado Común del Sur, Mercosur, a regional common market which includes Brazil, Paraguay and Uruguay, Chile and Bolivia are associate members. Mercosur came into effect on January 1, 1995, 
and includes a free trade area and common external tariffs on most traded goods. Argentina is also a member of the World Trade Organization. The United States and Argentina have a close bilateral relationship, due in part to Argentina's recent efforts to open its economy and realign its foreign policy. Since the 1990s, Argentina has been one of Latin America's most politically and economically stable countries. In 1999, Fernando de la Rua became the president, replacing Carlos Menem who had led the country for 10 years. Mr. de la Rua has pledged to continue similar policies to his predecessor and has stressed attracting foreign investment. Cutting the budget deficit is a major push of his administration. Native Americans had long mined surface exposures of copper veins near the new Cornelia for pigments, red copper oxide and green copper carbonate. Spanish miners are known to have excavated test shafts in the area by 1,750, but the amount of copper produced is not known. Americans claimed the location in 1,854 and shipped a few loads of selected ore to Swansea, Wales, but high transportation charges left little or no profit, and the mine was abandoned one. Development of the property was delayed because of its remote location in the Sonoran Desert. The low-grade copper ore could not be economically shipped to a smelter, and had to be concentrated at the site. The Cornelia Copper Company was organized by businessmen from St. Louis in 1900 to develop the property. However, early owners fumbled in their search for a suitable treatment process, and fell victim to process men. In 1906 the owners contracted with Fred McGahan to build his unique vacuum smelter to treat the ore. The following year the company had McGahan indicted for obtaining money under false pretenses. It then arranged with another inventor to build facilities to treat the ore by the unproven Anderson process, which proved just as useless as McGahan's process. A United States Geological Survey author later described these processes as, among the most bizarre ever to have been floated in American mining. Two mining commentator Horace Stevens wrote,